Our scripture this morning comes to us from Matthew 7, verse 7. <laughs> and I'm just going to have to say it to you because my Bible decided to update now. That's the problem with <laughs> um, electronic, I mean, digital devices. But anyway, Matthew 7, 7 says, Seek and ye shall find. Or, um, now I forget it. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be opened. And it shall be given to you. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Anyway, that's something to that effect. Yes, I'm sorry. My Bible went away on me. Um, I do want to say something, though, about the first part of our worship service. It's been a real blessing to me so far. I don't know about you. Were you blessed in all the different things, even with our children's story with just two children, but was a great story for the rest of us. The worship team that was up here, I have to say, I felt like I was in school. Um, those five were my, among my first students here at Thunderbird. Um, it was a pretty cool feeling to be sitting on that side of things and letting them teach me. Um, I loved Bob's idea, I'm gonna do that. Um, that's a wonderful thing, a lot of good, good messages inside. And now we have our friend and colleague, Mark, who's going to share the message, and I'm sure he'll tell us the, the actual verse, but it's Matthew 7, 7. <laughs> Good morning. All right, we're working. It was one of those weeks, you'll, you'll notice in your bulletin that the Bible verse that's printed there, I believe, is uh, Luke 1, 7. Is that right? 17? Well, whatever it was, it was not the right verse, and that was my fault. It was not a typo. It was an accurate representation of what I texted um, over the phone, what the Bible verse was. When I looked at it and I read it, and I was like, this is not what I meant. Um, I was in the airport when I texted that, so my apologies. Um, the actual Bible verse um, is Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, but I'm going to take a unique approach to, to starting off this morning. Uh, I have the privilege of teaching the junior Bible class at Thunderbird Adventist Academy. And one of the things that um, I really enjoy about that is the opportunity to answer questions. Um, young people have great questions, and some of the questions they ask make you squirm in your, in your, your shoes. And uh, sometimes you can't answer the question right then. You have to do a little work to, to find a good answer. And uh, I've, I substituted for Pastor Zach last year and, and got the great idea of having a like a uh, he has a bulletin board, I believe, with questions that students ask, and he posts the questions on the bulletin board. They're anonymous, so there's no, nobody feels, you know, stupid or vulnerable or anything like that. And so I have this little tub, and I asked the students that first week of class to p write down any questions that they had about Christianity, the Bible, anything like that. And uh, they wrote some really good questions. And one of the questions I'm going to start with today. Um, has nothing to do with the sermon. Um, you guys ever listen to Doug Batchelor, some of the, 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 you know, presentations that he does? He oftentimes opens with a question and answer series, and he'll pick a few out. And uh, so I'm going to adopt that for this morning's worship service, and we're going to start off with a really great Bible question. And the reason I want to share this with you is because it's personal to me. When I was um, in middle school, I had a aunt and uncle who had a baby, and the baby died of SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And uh, that was one of the things that I wrestled with through my teens and even early 20s. And to be quite honest with you, it was one of several questions that was never answered in a way that represented God's character to me and pushed me into um, a several-year period where I called myself an atheist. Um, and uh, my aunt and uncle... When the, the baby passed away, they went to their priest, and the priest told them that, uh, you know, they, they asked the question, we hadn't had our baby baptized yet, will my baby be in heaven? And the answer was 
probably spoken as gently as possible, but the priest said to my aunt and uncle, I'm sorry, your baby will not be in heaven because it was not baptized. They never set foot in a church again that I know of. I don't, I actually, I'm not, I, was not, I wish I was closer to them, but uh, I know that that had to just sear their heart. Um, it, it definitely put a distaste for Christianity in my heart at that young age, and I wrestled with that. And then I've heard other people say, well, a baby will go to heaven if their parents are saved, and if their parents are lost, it will be as if they never were. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. I've, I've heard that several times. Um, I have an idea where that came from, and I believe it's taken out of context where that theory came from. But I did a little research, and I, I, I dug in the Bible, and I found some things that give me some reassurance, and I'm going to share those with you today. So the first question I had to ask myself was, are babies born sinners? And there's a few Bible texts here, one from Romans 23, 4, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, that doesn't sound very reassuring. Digging a little deeper, I find in Psalm 51, verse 5, it says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and my sin, and in sin my mother conceived me. Well, you look at those two Bible verses and it looks like we're left out to dry, right? But is our God fair and just? Is he merciful? And does he have a grander plan than we can even ever conceive in our own minds? Yes, he does. Um, Deuteronomy 34, or 32, 4 says, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So there are a couple Bible examples that I'm going to point out here to kind of set, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for myself. I, I feel like if I share this message with you, there has to be someone else out there who has asked this question, someone else out there who has gone through the pain of maybe a loved one or something like that who's passed away. Someone else has had to have this question. One of my students asked this question, so I know it's out there, and sometimes we don't have an instant answer. So here's a Bible example. Uh, this is from Isaiah 1.18, and it says, uh, I'm sorry, this leads us into, um, it says, come let us reason together. I put that in there because I know our God is a reasonable God. Amen? The example comes from Jeremiah 19, verse 4. Jeremiah 19, verse 4, and it says, because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they their fathers, nor the kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. Now what Jeremiah is talking about here is Judah slipping into idolatry to the point where they were actually sacrificing their own people to other gods. That's a pretty sad state to be in, especially when we're talking about Judah. These people should have been the closest to God. The end part there where it says, filled this place with the blood of the innocents. Now we do a little digging and research, we find out that many of these people that were sacrificed, these human sacrifices, were children and babies. And here the scriptures call them the innocents. Now that seems interesting to me, if a person is, if a baby dies and if, as some people say that baby is only saved if their parents are saved, then why is it that these babies are called innocent? These children who are sacrificed, these babies, why are they called innocent? Their parents were obviously worshiping idols and sacrificing humans, which was definitely against God's plan. So if the theory that a lot of people say that a baby is saved only if their parents are saved, I think we can reason together that these babies who are called innocent, it, it, it doesn't fit. You see where I'm going with that? Does that make sense? God call, or In the scriptures, God's saying that these are innocent. Now, that's slightly gray still to me. That, that doesn't, that's not the, the, the stamp that, that makes me happy and want to walk away with my head up. But it is one small step in that. And I'm going to share another story with you. Um, well, first let's read Psalm 139, 13. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. God obviously has 
care for us and interest in us from the very time of conception. He is invested in life. And from the time a baby is conceived, God is part of that. And uh, we, we think about that in babies, and it goes on to, to tell us that unless we be like these children, we're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of verses that allude to the fact that we need to become like children to even enter into heaven. Now I'm going to read a little story to you. You guys know King David, right? King David made some amazing victories in his life, but he also had some pretty poor choices as well. And an impulsive afternoon or evening, he was up on his roof, and he looks, and he sees Bathsheba bathing on her roof. He calls for her. They have an inappropriate interaction. She becomes pregnant. He goes, and he calls for Uriah to come and tries to deceive him into thinking that it's his child. Uriah, in his uprightness and integrity, sticks to the, the truth and goes back into the battlefield with his own death warrant, and David is now guilty of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Adultery, thank you. He's, he's guilty of adultery, and he's guilty of murder, okay? The baby that was conceived, you know, is born. Him and Bathsheba get together, and then we read this, and David is mourning because his child with Bathsheba is now sick to the point of death. And it says this. It says, uh, while the child was alive, they're questioning David, because while this child was still alive and sick, David was fasting and he spent days on his face in prayer and repentance. And it was asked David, while the child was alive, uh, or David is actually saying this, he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. The baby had passed away. David stopped mourning. He stopped weeping. He stopped lamenting. He said, I shall go to him, talking about this child, but he shall not return to me. Why would David say that? Why would David rejoice and feel comfort in the fact that his baby is no longer suffering if this baby is going to be in heaven someday. David knows that he will be reunited with that baby. Amen? Does that make sense? Now, that seems pretty clear to me. Amen? Are you guys confused? Am I confused? Is, I hope this makes sense to you. To me, that made perfect sense. That's straight from the scriptures. Ezekiel 18.20, because somebody's going to say, well, you know, that's only because David's going to be in heaven, and there's just an example where, you know, the baby is really saved and going to be in heaven because David eventually, you know, repents and God forgives him, and David's going to be in heaven. Is that the way salvation works? Not according to Scripture. That sounds like a lukewarm faith to me, right? God is not lukewarm. He is either hot or cold, Right? So let's look at this for a second. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Our children's eternal destiny is not based on our salvation. It is based on Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Why is it that when John the Baptist was baptizing in the River Jordan, Jesus came and wanted to baptize, and he said, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus looked at him, and he said, we need to go ahead and go through with this to fulfill all righteousness. Wherever there are gaps, Jesus Christ fills them in. Where a baby is called innocent in the place of sinful parents, when David says, I, my child will not return to me, but I will go where he is in heaven. Now, we obviously know the baby didn't go that day, but in the resurrection, that baby will be in heaven. And there's an author by the name of Ellen White who has a really good quote that I want to share with you. And this, all the evidence is right there in the scripture, but I believe that this little thing, this little um, quote from her uh, gives a little more insight into this. This, this Bible scholar says, 
as the little infants, this is talking about the resurrection day. This is found in um, Book 2, Selected Messages, page 260, and it says this, As the little infants come forth from their dusty beds, what, what are these dusty beds that he's, she's talking about here? The grave, right? As these little infants come forth from their graves, they immediately wing their way to their mother's arms. There we have an example of children whose parents are saved. The baby is placed back into their mother's arms. They meet again, never more to part. But many of the little ones have no mother there. Hmm. Many of the little ones have no mother there. We listen in vain for the rapturous song of triumph from the mother. The angels receive the motherless infants and conduct them to the tree of life. These infants, whose parents were not saved, are then raised by angels in the kingdom of God. And when I think, when I look at all that evidence, and I think of the way my aunt and uncle were treated when their child passed away, and I know there are a lot of strange theories on what happens when a baby dies. This gives me hope and it gives me reassurance that not only we do, serve, do we serve a just God, but when we, have, when we experience the day of uh, the resurrection day, it's going to be more glorious than any of us have ever imagined. And uh, that gives me reassurance. How about you guys? Yeah. Amen. So that was a great question asked by one of my juniors in my Bible class. And uh, we spent some time talking on that. And um, hopefully whoever asked that question, I still actually don't know who it was, um, walked away knowing that God is love. Now, let's fast forward. We're going to talk about something else today. I wanted to share that with you because it's it been weighing on my heart. It's something that really caused me to get off track, and uh, I thought, well, you know what, why not? The more people hear it, the more people can give other people comfort when they have the same question. So, all right, so our sermon title today is Let the Spirit Come. I am looking forward to that day of resurrection. How about you? I do believe that that day is getting closer and closer and closer. And that's an obvious thing. Obviously, you know, every day we live, we're getting closer. But I do believe that we are living in the last seconds of uh, Earth's history. And when Jesus comes again in those clouds, I want to be ready. One of the things that we can do to help be ready for that day is to have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we talk about the 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 bridesmaids with their oil before Jesus comes. Some ran out and had to go get more. Some had enough. They all fell asleep, right? They all fell asleep. But the ones who had enough oil in their lamps were the ones who were saved. Do you have enough oil in your lamp? Do I have enough oil in my lamp? We all have an element of the Holy Spirit in us. But it's those who have enough that are going to make it. We need to ask God for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that latter rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, we need that now. And I think as a church, as individuals, as families, that's something that should be on the very top of our prayer list every day. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, it's pretty simple. We can't understand the scriptures without some help, right? We know the scriptures are God's word to us, right? The Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. God gave us this love letter. And through revelation, God impressed these, these words that were penned in men's hearts. Okay? And then they were inspired to write those down to share with the rest of us. And then through the process of illumination, we come to understand those words that have, be, that have been written. The Holy Spirit is a part of all of that. God giving us the word and us understanding it. That is all the Holy Spirit. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, amen? Without the Holy Spirit, like many people, we can read through the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and walk away saying, oh, that was okay, that was a good book. And some interesting fables, stories, a lot of fiction. But if we have the Holy Spirit, we can walk away a changed person becoming like the image of our Creator. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Our natural state is not to be drawn toward 
no understanding scriptures. We are born in confusion, we are born in sin, and we are born with a natural tendency toward that sin. But there is still this empty hole in our heart that we seek for that can only be fulfilled with God. And we find that as God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, that still small voice, that whisper, that wooing of the Holy Spirit, whether it be through nature or whether it be through another person or the actual voice of God like some prophets and people like that have the, had the opportunity to experience. John fourteen twenty six says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Because we're lost without it. We can't even understand what Jesus is saying. The disciples who walked and talked with Jesus for three and a half years didn't quite understand what he's saying. They were lacking that fullness of the Holy Spirit. For many of them, it wasn't until after the fact that they understood, oh, that's what Jesus meant by that. I do believe there is one example of someone who got it. The lowest of the low, Mary Magdalene. I do believe that she got it. And in her illiterate, ignorant way, she got the meat of what it was all about. She anointed Christ. She was the first one at his tomb, the last one to leave. She was the first one who Christ revealed himself to. We can have that experience if we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives. How do we seek the Holy Spirit? Our Bible verse today from Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. We have to pursue the Holy Spirit. Once we get a little bit, it gives us, gives us that taste. We're drawn to it, and we have to seek it. We have to ask for it. We have to knock, and the door will be opened. We do have a part in receiving the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is a free gift but we have to take the wrapper off and open the box. Amen? Matthew 13, says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Man finds a treasure. He knows its value. He goes and he sells everything he has so he can be the legal owner of that treasure. He buries it in the field in fear that someone else might take it from him. He plans ahead. He takes care of all the affairs in his life that lead for him to be able to have it in its fullness. He buys the field. He has the treasure. I share a little story that happened to me when I was 16 years old. I had the opportunity to go to Sydney, Australia for 10 days to run a, a race. And while I was there, I was with a group of American athletes and um, we were touring around Sydney, and we got to see the Opera House and all the cool stuff, and the um, pretty backcountry we went to a really cool ranch, and they taught us how to throw a boomerang, and they sheared a sheep for us, and then we had a big steak dinner and all this kind of stuff. One of the cool things we got to see, though, were some opals. We went to a jewelry store that specialized in opals. In Australia, they have these opal fields and stuff like that, and it's one of the places in the world where they have some of the nicest and most abundant opals. And uh, the person behind the counter was holding up this beautiful black opal that was worth more than $10,000. And we were ooing and eyeing and, ooh, it's so pretty, and all this kind of stuff. And he was explaining to us what opals are, why they're valued, what opals are more expensive than others, and all this kind of stuff. And I was standing in there with all my peers. I, was, I, I, was, I grew up in Indiana, and for some reason on this trip, I was the only kid from Indiana uh, among, amongst these athletes. And uh, most of the kids were from California. And when you're a little corn-fed Midwestern boy, people from California were perceived as cool, okay? Um, if you just, it didn't matter if you were cool or not. If you were from California, it's like, whoa, you're from California? It's like a different country or something. Yeah, kind of is actually like a different country. But. Um, and I was standing there, and back when I was 16 years old, it was cool to have these shoes. We called them boats, okay? Boats like little leather brown loafers, and we would do the laces in a way where um, you didn't even have to tie them. We'd do this little coily thing where I, I can't even explain it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody else grow up in the 80s? And Raise your hand. I, I don't want to be alone. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. My wife's with me. Okay, there's another hand back there. All right. Thank you, Oliver. 
You know what I'm talking about. So I had these boats on, and it was cool to not wear socks with them. Okay? Now, teenage boys have a tendency to not have the best hygiene. I did, you know, take showers and things like that, but I, I tended to wear these cool shoes so often that they never had a time to dry out, if you know what I mean. Do you ever smell a leather shoe after a 16-year-old sweaty foot has been in it for eight hours? It's not real pleasant. And I was very aware of that and very much not wanting to ever take my shoes off until I got home so I could wash my feet and it wouldn't reek the whole entire house. Well, here this guy is showing us the opal, and I'm standing there all cool with my boats on and no socks. My feet are fermenting in these shoes. And the guy behind the counter drops the opal. Ting, 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 ting. And then there was no noise. No one knew where the opal went except for me. It had bounced off the counter onto the floor and right into the arch of my foot, into the deep crevices of my fermenting loafer. I immediately took a deep breath, and I looked to my right, and I looked to my left, and I thought, I could walk out right now, and no one would know that I have this $10,000 plus opal in my shoe. But even back then, I had a conscience enough to tell me that that would not be a good idea. I didn't want to spend the rest of my vacation in the uh, Sydney prison or jail. So I did the unthinkable, and I took my stinky, smelly, fermented shoe off my foot, quickly grabbed the opal, put the shoe on as fast as possible, and hoping that the, the, the waft of that odor wouldn't you know, fill the whole room, and I gave it to the person behind the counter. Well, I somehow lived through that embarrassing moment. But the point of the story is, I had a very, very valuable treasure land right in my shoe. I didn't have to knock. I didn't ask. I didn't seek. As a matter of fact, I didn't even want it. And when I got it, I wanted to get rid of it as quickly as possible. The Holy Spirit should not be like that experience. We should seek it. We should knock for it. We should pursue it like nothing else. We should sell everything we have so that we can be the rightful owners of the Holy Spirit. Good thing for us, all we have to sell is our old life and be born again in Christ because he's already paid the price. Amen? Speaking of gaining the Holy Spirit, is it possible to have the Holy Spirit and then let it go? You guys heard the old expression, once saved, always saved, right? Is there any truth to that? Can a person have the Holy Spirit and do great things for God and have a relationship with God and then have experiences and choices in their life that lead them astray to where they backslide so far that they let go entirely and turn the opposite direction, right? I mean, Lucifer was the highest ranking angel in heaven. All the angels adored him. He had opportunities and and experiences that even some of the unfallen angels didn't get to have. Yet he slept. He chose his way out of it. We can too. So my plea to you now is this. Don't give up up the Holy Spirit once you have it. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God to whom you were sealed, or by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We have got to let, we have got to hold on to that thing. Um, I share another quick little story with you. When I was teaching up in Flagstaff, I taught at a middle school. We taught seventh and eighth graders up there, and it was a public school, and we had some drugs in our school. We had some issues. And uh, there was another school just about a half mile away from us that was a correctional school. And in one of our staff meetings after school one day, the principal said, hey, you know, some of these kids from this high school down the street have been lingering around the outskirts of our campus, and they've been trying to get our kids to buy drugs. If you see these kids, and a lot of them we had had in our school before, I knew a few of them, 
If you see these kids, you need to let the office know immediately and you need to tell them to get off campus. They're not allowed here. They know they're not allowed here. They've been told they're not supposed to be on campus. And I thought, okay. And I taught a class called Outdoor Recreation. And so um, the class that I had at the end of one school day on a beautiful fall afternoon, uh, the weather was beautiful, sun was out. I can remember this day, walking back into the, the class or into the building, the last period, getting them all back into school so they could go home. And I noticed one of these kids was out on the outskirts of our parking lot on his, on his bike. And so I got the kids up toward the building. I did a large arc out to the edge of the parking lot and said, hey, man, school's going to dismiss here in like five minutes. You need to be gone. You know you're not supposed to be here. You need to go. I couldn't stand there and dialogue much more because I had to be with my kids. So I quickly caught up to the back of my class. We went in, and I had in the back of my mind that this kid is not going to obey what I just told him to do. So I get the kid settled, the bell rings, I immediately went right out and back to where that kid was, and sure enough, there was about 20, 25 kids walking over toward him, and he was on his bike, and they were interacting, and blah, 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 and I said, hey, you need to go now, and one of the other teachers called me over, I went back down the sidewalk toward the front of the school, she asked me something or another, and I, I answered her question, and then I went straight back down there to make sure that he was leaving, he was riding his bike along the sidewalk up toward the front of the school. So I just stood in the sidewalk, and as he got close to me, I just grabbed the frame of his bike, and I said, you can pick this up in the front office. He stepped off of his bike, and he said, give me my bike back. And I said, well, I gave you two opportunities to leave. I said, this bike has now become a safety issue. You're riding on the sidewalk. We're not, I don't care who you are. You're not supposed to ride your bike on the sidewalk and I'm going to take it into the front office. You can get it from the principal in there. Give me my bike. And he threw a few extra four-letter words in there that I can't repeat right here. And I said, I'm not going to let go of this bike. I said, school starts tomorrow morning at 7.40. I'll, I'm happy to stand here that long, but I'm not letting go of this bike. And it was a, a slight tug, you know, a little tug-of-war thing, and he realized that I wasn't going to let go. So this long dialogue, kids are all gathered around like, whoa, what's Mr. Cortez going to do now? Teachers walked by and saw this very uncomfortable confrontation, and several of them walked by, did the look over the shoulder, quickly put their nose to the line, and went quickly to their cars. Finally, the gentleman who was in charge of our disciplinary program came out. One of the students, I said, go get Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis was a retired firefighter. That almost sounded bad. Firefighter, a speech impediment there. Um, he was a retired firefighter, and uh, he was a little scrappy guy. He said back in his glory days, he could climb up the fire ladder upside down. He was just a real strong guy, very athletic. And he came out, and he, I'm a very calm person. I don't, I don't tend to yell, scream, get upset. I just literally said, I'm not letting go of this bike. And I'm just in a calm voice like that. And he was yelling and screaming at me, and I was just like, you can get it in the front office. This guy came out, and he's more in your face, like, what are you doing? You know, that kind of a thing. He comes out there, and uh, his adrenaline and excitement got the kid more pumped up, and the kid pushed him. Next thing I know, Mr. Lewis has the kid on the ground in a headlock. I'm thinking, goodness gracious, I did not want this to happen this way. And uh, the police were finally called. The police came and broke it all up. But here's the bottom line. I had a grip on that bike, and I wasn't letting go. Even in the face of confrontation, in the face of strife, in the face of uncertainty of what was going to happen, this kid could have pulled out a knife, he could have pulled up a gun, he, other guys could have come and jumped me. I didn't know. But I wasn't going to let go of that bike. Why do we so easily let go of the Holy Spirit? Why do we so easily let go of the one thing that's going to get us through to the end? There was no advantage for me to hold on to that bike. It was just because I didn't want this kid messing with my students. It wasn't even a grand, great cause. I could have just walked him off campus and said, get out of here. We have so much more in stake with the Holy Spirit. We have so much more reason to hold on and never let go. We need to make sure that our lamps are full of oil. Ephesians 4.30, one more time. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Why is this so important? Why is this so important? We live in the end times, and there are crazy things happening all around us. I want to share a short story from uh, the book of Acts. Stephen, okay, the first deacon, right? Or one of the first deacons. He was a man who could preach. He was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a man who ended his last days in a very similar manner to Christ. He died. He was a martyr. He said, forgive them for they know, they know not what they're doing. I mean, similar words to Christ. And here we have Stephen, who was opposed by this group of men called the Synagogue of Freedom. And they questioned him. They challenged him. And Stephen refuted them with the word of God. And it says in Acts 6.10, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit, when oppressed by these men, trying to squelch him out of existence because they threatened their faith, even though he had the words of life, and they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. We need that same Holy Spirit. And then it goes on in verse 15, it says, and all who sat in the council, they had brought him because they had falsely accused him, and they brought him to the council, and he sat in the council, verse 15, looking steadfastly at him, and they saw his face as if it were the face of an angel. He had the glory of God shining through him. I'm going to end on this last short story. I know we're getting late here. When I lived in Kansas, there was a ministry called Socks for Souls, and we delivered socks to homeless people. And my friend and I, uh, my friend is the one who started and maintains this ministry, and one afternoon he invited me to go with him. And so we went out into what they call the Bottoms. This is in Kansas City, if anybody's ever been there. There's an area um, in Kansas City called the Bottoms, and it has that name for the reason, because it is the pits. It's the slum, deserted gas stations with weeds growing up, vacant lots, um, bypasses going up and over. And we went in this area with our bag full of socks and little literature to pass out, scripture verses and things like that. And a lady had baked some muffins. We had some muffins to give out too. And we go into this situation. I'm going to keep this story short. We're looking for a particular man, and we're calling out his name. And in seeking for this man that he had had some interaction with the previous few weeks, two other guys come from the distance. And we see him, and we start to approach him until we realize that they were very aggressive. They were, they were drunk, they were swearing, they were cussing, and they were telling us to get out of their territory. And by the time we realized really what was going on, they were upon us. And we felt very threatened. We were very vulnerable. All I had was a backpack full of socks and muffins. I mean, you can't defend yourself with socks and muffins. And these guys were very, very aggressive. And the smaller of the two was very, very drunk. And he was throwing punches at us. Luckily, he was very uncoordinated. And we were just, you know, backing up. He started to try to kick us. Long story short, there was about a five, ten minute interaction of them kicking and spitting and all this kind of stuff. And then one guy, the bigger of the two guys, had picked up a rock about the size of a man's head. And he was holding it like this, looking at which, which were the two of us he was going to clock first. And I'm sitting there thinking in my mind, why are we still here? We could easily outrun these guys. And I kept looking at my friend Michael for that cue, like, let's jet. But he never did. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I can't leave him here by himself. So I, I stood there by him thinking, well, this is going to be an interesting obituary. <laughs> Finally, somehow, some way, as we're trying to explain to these two aggressive, drunk guys that we are from the church, we're here to help, we have stuff for you. The larger of the two guys with the rock puts the rock down and kind of comes to and then starts to convince the other guy that we're there to help. Well, in the process, the other guy, as, this, as the other guy with the rock is trying to convince him, hey, man, they're from the church. They're here to help. The other guy is literally lunging toward me, trying to bite me. I know this sounds crazy, and you're thinking, wow, how could this be? They, they were that close. And I didn't want to make sudden moves or anything like that, but he kept kicking me, and I just, he'd kick, and I'd just kind of block his foot down like this. We're just, we're just trying to help, you know, trying to keep my voice gentle and all that kind of stuff. Well, he lunges forward me. I have a, it's in the wintertime. I had a thick fleece on that I, had, had, I was wearing to keep warm. And he lunges for me, and I, I back up, In the bagginess of the fleece, he caught it in his mouth, and I heard the fleece ripping through his teeth as I backed away. This happened twice. Finally, 
he calmed down to the point where we could actually have a normal conversation. I don't know if I should share this. There's not many kids here, so I'm going to go ahead and share this. The guy who was the most drunk went from rage and blood-curdling anger to passion. He was a um, brute homosexual, and then he now tried to force himself. He was literally trying to pull us to kiss us and this kind of... I mean, I, you're, you're all thinking, like, what is... It was a crazy story. You would have had to have been there. The, yeah. <laughs> I know I just made everyone very uncomfortable. I'm sorry. Maybe it's a blessing all the children are at Camelback today. This interaction action happened. The other guy's trying to, dude, knock it off. They're from the church. Stop it. And finally, he, he calmed down. And we were able to talk to them a little bit about Christ. We were able to share the fact that God loves them and that we have some socks for them and some muffins. And if they could help us find this other guy, we'd be much appreciative. Next thing we know, we're, we're, all four of us are standing there with our arms on each other's shoulders, leaning forward, and we're praying. I, it's, it was all so surreal. I don't really understand the transitions. It was the Holy Spirit. And as we prayed with these guys, it went from us praying to them praying for us. It was very weird. And then the guy started cussing during the prayer, and the other guy started yelling at him, cussing, telling him not to cuss while we're praying. But we finally said amen, and I was ready for that amen. I'm not going to lie to you. And they led us over to where the guy was who we were originally looking for, and they were sitting against a deserted gas station with weeds and dirt, and they were just sitting there, and they all had their bottles with the brown bags over them, and they were all drinking. And we shared some more gospel. We prayed with them. And one of the gentlemen who was there, I can remember distinctly, he was more of a handsome, well, well-spoken. He was a Native American man. Um, I, I remember that because I thought of him as the chief of, of these guys. He was definitely in charge and the only one who was with it. And he looked at Michael and myself, and he kind of put his hands like by the other guys, and he kind of leaned back a little bit. He says, look at it. Do you see it? And the other guy looks and he says, yeah. And Michael and I were like, what? And he said, they're glowing. They're glowing. I believe that very day that God was with us. He was in the fire with us. There was no reason under the sun that we shouldn't have got our heads bashed in with that rock or worse. Come to find out a couple weeks later, these gentlemen had been arrested for raping other homeless people and beating them. They had raped an old man and broke his arm, put him in the hospital. This, this day that we inter interacted with these men, hopefully some sort of a seed was planted. I, I, I compare these two men to the de demoniac on the Sea of Galilee. That was, that's the best thing I can compare these two men to. But for some reason, that brief moment, they came to their senses, and we had a normal dialogue and, and were able to pray with them. I don't know what's going to ever happen to these guys, but it was a testimony to me that when you have the Holy Spirit, He will be with you, and He will fill you up, and He will be in the fire with you. Let's pray. Lord, let us, like Stephen, stand in the face of opposition, even danger, even death, proclaiming truth in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know as the day approaches that the world is getting worse and worse and worse and that we will have uncomfortable encounters. We will be questioned. We'll be tried. But Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit can help us to overcome. And we invite your Holy Spirit to be in the midst of this church today, in each one of our hearts, and to guide us and lead us into your kingdom. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all the church said, Amen.